United States seems to have a packet of responsibilities. The judicial system, the Congress, you know, lawyers, defense lawyers, prosecuting attorneys, they seem to have different responsibilities, <laughs> different purposes. <laughs> and so it's all at the, at the relative level. And, and what maybe we would want to do is you start there and you feel like all of a sudden you have a calling to wake up. So you want to go from where I perceive myself as a person, maybe as a mother, maybe as an employee or different kind of things. And, oh, this is where I perceive myself, Jesus. Now, help me lift up and go transcend beyond those duties and responsibilities to my one responsibility to accept the atonement for myself. And Rhonda and Beverly have, did a, have done a search through the course on responsibility. <laughs> you know, this brings up an interesting story. When I was in Chicago with my parents, my mother was, of course, telling me about how I'm responsible for my children, and that's very important, and she didn't understand this. And she, did, she told me a story that really happened to her in a dream. She was very sick with the flu, and, you know, and she, in the dream, died. And in the dream, she had sort of a life-after-death experience like you would be, you've read about with the tunnel, the light. And God, in this dream, said, come. And she said, it was so clear. And she, and she said to me, she said, and you know what I did? I said, no, God. I still have seven children to raise, and I need to go back to them. And she said, and I came back, Mary. You know, and I'm thinking about that now because that wasn't what God said in that dream. He didn't say, go back. You have responsibilities. He said, come. You know, and so, I mean, to me, that's at best a metaphor for the feeling of the call and what that means. Getting a 
established in the world is like his calling was like calling me out of the world. Not this wasn't a midlife crisis in the terms of the 40s or whatever. This was like a mid, this was like a midlife crisis in the in the 20s. And we well, even got started. Yeah. And I can I can clearly remember too at one point where I just I remember saying, all right, all right, all right. I know it's you, I know you're calling, but I haven't experienced a real romantic male-female relationship. And furthermore, I'm not coming <laughs> until I do. And about two months later, I seem to embark on probably the, the, the biggest roller coaster ride of my life. I thought I'd, I'd hit emotional highs and emotional lows. Until, <laughs> until that, it was like, and at the same time, I was reading a lot of, of things that were very helpful in helping me sort through beliefs and see where my attachments were in my mind, and then the Course came during that relationship, so to speak, which really accelerated the process, because this is a Course to be used with relationships. This is not a Course to, that's designed to go up to the Himalayas, never take all your food, never see anybody ever again and pop open your book. You could use it that way if you <laughs> if you were guided to, but generally it's designed, as he says in the course itself, that it's designed for even through relationships. And again, the way relationships are perceived is with bodies. We're going to work towards a state of, of one-mindedness, but you begin with, with seeing that, oh, Everything I can't stand in my mind, I'm going to dump and project onto this other significant others, family members, employees, employers, you know, those kind of things. So those are the kind of things, just to give you a little flavor, that's, that I was really questioning. Those are, my, those are the feathers mm -hmm. that are, and it came very obvious to me at the end, seemingly, of that relationship that, that I was, by then, I was course was to be my path. I was going in a direction that I, I had a sense of where it was going, but again, what form it would unfold, I had not a clue, and I couldn't have even ventured a guess at what seemed to happen after that, so it's just good to bounce back down to faith. Anybody want to read the first? The sole responsibility of a miracle worker is to accept the at one atonement for himself. This means you recognize that mind is the only creative level and that its errors are healed by the atonement. Once you accept this, your mind can only heal by denying your mind any destructive potential and reinstating its purely constructive powers. You place yourself in a position to undo the level confusion of others. The message you then give to them is the truth that their minds are similarly constructive and their miscreations cannot hurt them. By affirming this, you release the mind from over-evaluating its own learning device and restore the mind to its true position as the learner. That's packed. It is. Every sentence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you could start with perhaps even the second sentence and say that take a look at that thing. You recognize that the mind is the only creative level. And that's when I talk about level confusion, that's the only level confusion that there is, is to believe that the world of form, or if we had our diagram of the concentric circle, believe that the screen, the outer circle, is positive. That's the level of confusion. That is not realizing that the mind is the only creative level. That's seeing that that the, the wrong mind or the, the world of form seems to be positive or creative. So, any direction we come at it, whether we come at it from fields of seemingly fields of medicine, where it seems like certain treatments that are given to the body bring about a relief to the mind, where it seems like operations to the body bring about relief to the mind. Treatments like um, putting ice 
mantra is something a jointed swelling is to bring relief to the mind. Um, even therapeutic touch, even massage in some of the, the more subtle realms, you know, where people where you massage the body and, and so forth and this and that. Or even if you put the laying on of hands, if you think that it was the laying on of hands in a spiritual sense that, that brought comfort to the mind, that would all be something on the screen is, is bringing relief to the mind. You know, we talked about a little bit about diet. You know, the whole we got into a little bit to the vegetarian and meat and, and cholesterol, and calories, you know, all the different things. It seems like, you know, if you can control your diet that you won't be so obese and the body won't won't be such a strain on the heart and all those things that we that are, are learned a part of that system and it seems like diet is an important part of feeling good, of the mind feeling good. Again, that would have to be that there's something on the screen that's causative that can bring the mind relief. It seems as if eating certain kinds of food brings gas. <laughs> gas is belting is not a comfortable feeling like, oh, I've I can't eat, you know, I can't eat those things, or I can't drink too much soda, or, you know, too many beans, or <laughs> too this or that, because I'll, I'll have, you know, digestion problems, or something like that. Again, that's experienced as something on the screen influences the state of mind. It seems like climate has a lot to do with the state of mind. You know, I like a drier a drier air climate. I, I, I can't stand, you know, this or that. Or if I have allergies and, and you know, people have talked, I'm sure when people have, have come to visit, you know, where they, it seems polite to say, you know, to keep this cat hair, <laughs> are you allergic to cats or whatever? Yeah. You know, it, again, it seems like there's certain things um, that are in the environment that are more conducive to the health and the relief of the mind. So really what you can see is we're I'm giving and throwing out just spewing out a lot of specific examples to, to say that, that that one thing there to accept the atonement for oneself is to means you recognize that the mind is the only creative level. And that means we really need to question a lot of beliefs in which it appears that the screen is the creative level. That's how we come to that awareness of the mind being Probably on the um, tapes that you listen to, uh -huh. Intenses on the Bay, one of the other ways that David talks about, talked about this was speaking of backward, <coughs> backward thoughts, forward thoughts. And backward thoughts would be any thoughts that support the belief that there is something on the screen that is positive. And a forward thought is, is the thought that supports the, the fact that only the mind is positive. Maybe even saying supports the fact it represents the fact. Represents the fact. The fact. That the mind is, only the mind is positive. That would be just a definition of right-mindedness. <laughs> mm -hmm. The right mind sees the mind is powerful and the mind is causative, and the projections don't influence the mind. <laughs> that, that everything that's a miscreation, where it seems, even if you saw two bodies and one body seem to be beating another, and one body seemed to be inflicting pain on another, it would be saying that something on the screen is it one of the feathers <laughs> is inflicting pain on one of the other feathers. And Jesus is saying, no, no, that's not how it works. It certainly seems that way in this world. It seems as if there are positive events and circumstances that certainly seem to inflict pain, one image to another image. And, and Jesus is saying, those are miscreations, to use the, the word that he um, talked about in the second sentence from the bottom, the message you then give to them is the truth that their minds are similarly constructed or creative, and their miscreations cannot hurt them.